Welcome back to the ABC Little Berry News Hour. Tonight we have a very special guest interviewed by Hugo Armani. We have David Sedaris, author, author of his newly acclaimed book, Dress Your Family in Corduroy and Denim. Afterwards, it will be reviewed and criticized by James Bonds. Please enjoy the program. Tonight's featured guest is a critically acclaimed author. His name is David Sedaris. Please give it up for David Sedaris. Uh, hello, Hugo. Nice to meet you, David. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure. Now, tonight, I'm going to be asking you several questions, and I hope you can respond as best as possible. I'll do my best. Okay. So first, I'm just going to ask you, your new book called Dress Your Family in Corduroy and Denim. Why did you write this book? Can you tell us a little bit about that? No. Um, so then, can you tell us how, you're, how you, what you hope that your audience would feel? No. Well then, uh, what can <laughs> I do with it? Okay. Um, well, I just felt a need to educate the public on morals, basically. That's what all my essays have morals that I learned in my life, and I, I learned stuff from my experiences, and then I just wanted to share that with the reader, basically, in a funny way. It's good. It's good. Now, David, I know you have various memoirs in this book, and some are positive, some are negative. Could you give me an example of how your negative memoirs can impact the public, how they can teach the public some sort of moral? Well, yeah, I actually do have that experience. Um, I remember one time that my dad, well, we all used to go to a beach every year, basically, and my dad, this one time, was he looked at this great beach house, right? He brought me and my three sisters over, and it was just the, the best thing ever. He's like, I'm going to get you this because you deserve it. And have any of you people at home ever had a parent who, who promises something and then doesn't deliver on it? I mean, that's pretty, you know, crushing, right? Well, as it turns out, he didn't buy the house. Yeah, so he didn't end up buying the house. He did not, and that sucked. What happened in the future? Well, that set a precedent for um, his behavior later in, in the future. I, we just we just learned that he he was going to make empty promises, and wow. that and that changed the value of him. Still, the guy. But. That must have really affected you as a little as a little kid. Not really. No. No, it did. Of course, it did. But. You know, we just want to accept them, and that's the way it was. Now, obviously, this is a very stressful part of the book, and it's very difficult for you to talk about because I'm sure it is because it's about your father. But um, we can move on to a lighter subject. So I'm sure, like any of you that has read Dress Your Family in Corduroy and Denim, you're probably familiar with the part where uh, he talks about a very happy memory, which is also results in several different things. When he's talking about his Halloween costume, how he was going door to door trick or treating, and then he eventually came home and eventually eats all of his candy because he's going trick-or-treating. David, would you be able to mention some of that for us? Because I know it's a very happy memory. It's really, uh, you know... It, it is. It's kind of like, wait, what? What's just, what's... There is. There. What's going on? No, never mind. Continue. Yeah, well, um... Alright, so we, we have these new neighbors come, right? And, well, they don't watch TV. I watch through their window, and you know what they do at dinner? They sit across the table and talk to each other. They talk? And that was, like, the most... Crazy thing! It was like a, a bombshell going off in my mind. They weren't watching TV. They they didn't own the TV. Oh. And I was like, "What's your furniture point at?" I remember I, that part in the book. Yeah. Yeah, I just didn't get it. And um, and so they were out of town for for Halloween. They come over the next day, and they ask for candy, right? And I don't want to give up my candy, but but my parents are saying like, "Go get your candy out of your room. You you gotta give it to them." Yeah. And so what I did, I didn't even like chocolate. Anytime I would eat chocolate, I would get a blinding headache, right? But um, my passion for making them not happy was so strong that I took all the candy I had, even the chocolate, and was just shoveling it down before my mom could get to my yeah, room. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, you know, I got a blinding headache. My mom came in anyway and took the last of it. And um, was it worth it? I'd like to think so. I'd like, um, yeah, I'd like to think so too. Right. I remember you would spy on them too. I remember reading that. Yeah, watch, watch them through the window. I know. Some call it creepy. I call it curiosity. It's naturalistic observation. Yeah. So, I actually read the book and I loved it myself. And I'm sure everyone out there would agree with me in the fact that, I mean, I believe his writing style, let's talk about your writing style specifically. I believe it's very sarcastic and witty. Now, what do you think? Well, I prefer to think of it as a um, genius, but um, some might call it witty, you know. Yeah, it's, it's just sarcastic. I try to put a uh, playful color on my stories. Playful. Playful, you know, silly, 
whatever adjective you people, you kids are using out there. And um, yeah, but I think that way um, readers get more interested in my work. Because if I just say, you know, uh, you know, be more caring, you know, yeah. that those are just cliche things that yeah, we, kids you hear all the I time. I noticed that you don't really deal with cliches at all. Right, so I, I use humor as a way of um, inter interesting the reader, you know. That's really to great. To draw them in. Now, um, going with the, sar the sarcastic outlook, I'm sure you obviously didn't feel this, this sarcasm in the moment, so how do you choose your memories? Do you pick them based on their sarcasm, or do you choose them in order to fit your writing style? Um, I pick strong memories, well, ones that I remember. don't remember a lot, because, you know, I used to smoke weed. I don't recommend that for anyone watching this. But um, the ones I do remember were very powerful, and I learned something from them. And, um, yeah, so, and then I applied my sarcastic witty writing style to that so but it was important for the memories to have a strong moral foundation for me and then then i would then i you know apply my what i think of it now which is you know funny and sarcastic so, yeah. so i noticed when i'm reading the book that each memoir individually every chapter conveys a specific emotion a specific feeling of the time mm -hmm. now how did you feel when writing about these things that you had felt so long ago um, well, now I can uh, look back on it and laugh, basically. I mean, a lot of the emotions I felt when writing these were very real. You know, I, I did feel very sad and uh, bullied. I, well, I felt sad when, uh, I remember a specific time where there was a, everyone, first off, everyone at, at home there, you all, you all went to school, right? You all went to school. So you all had a, a popular group and an unpopular group. I remember this moment. Yeah, well, I was that weird kid. That was the unpopular one, right? So when a cool kid, well, one of the cool kids, threw a rock at me and hit me in the back of the head, and my dad went to uh, his parents' house to try to get, like, like you know, try to sue them, basically, try to get money out of them. And I actually said that, um, that I wanted him to throw the rock at me because I just wanted to be accepted by them. Part of that, and I was a little embarrassed by my father's um, attitude because he was just totally disrespectful and... Um, pretty embarrassing his actions in that um, in that time but now I can look back on it and be like I actually said that I wanted the kid to throw the rock at me and it hit me in the back of my head and leave a mark I mean I, and I really did I actually wanted him to do it because I just wanted a chance to talk to someone cool I mean I'm so sure you've all had that experience so yeah? do you feel like this is a positive thing that it's really good to look back on these things yeah I mean I mean, it helps you learn from your mistakes, I guess. Yeah, like I learned how popularity doesn't mean everything. I mean, I was a loser, but I guess, well, more you've heard of me probably more than you've heard of the kid now, so it's I know true. I'm pretty pro true. like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to um, inform the public of this, you know, just tell an interesting story, and I learned stuff from it, and that's helped me now. That's great. So let's talk more about your writing style in and of itself. Now, I noticed when I was reading that you use various literary devices, such as flashback, predominantly. Yeah. So, why do you think you use so many flashbacks in order to contribute to the storyline? Okay, well, um, I think that lessons you learn from your childhood can be, you know, uh, applied to, uh, to uh, your situation when you're an adult. And that's what I did. Basically, at the beginning of most, not all, most um, of my memoirs, when I'm an adult, I flash back to when I was a kid, maybe sometimes with the character. I remember one example of when my brother um, didn't ask me to be best man at his wedding. Right. And I flashed back to when um, he almost died when he was a kid, when we were both swimming and he almost drowned because of me, because we went too far out. And how he, he said he hated me, and how that feeling just came back to me, like when, when he didn't ask me to be his best man at his wedding, even though, you know, I'm his only brother. And, um, yeah, that hurt, but... You know, I, I think the flashback does help the reader get a little more context of the situation. That makes sense, and it helps you compare your childhood to your adulthood. Yeah. That's great. I know. It. Well, David, what do you think you've gained from writing this book, Just Your Family in Quarter and Denim? Um, well, Hugo, lots of money. And uh, apart from that, I mean, I've gained... Uh, I, I've had a chance to recollect in my personal experiences, and, you know... And I could just reflect on the lessons I've learned, and how, and I hope that the lessons I've learned can help the readers, you know, because that was the point of the book, right? 
yeah, I know, it's kind of awesome. And yeah, I'm not sure I'm gonna, if I'm going to write another book, but um, yeah, it just gave me a chance to reflect on what I've learned you know, throughout my life, and it was pretty cool. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Sedaris, for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. Bye, America. I'll be sure to contact you in the future. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, for the critical review, I'll throw it over to James Bond. You've just heard an interview from the author himself. But I'm going, I'm here to give you the perspective of a third party candidate. My name is Bonds, James Bonds. There are a lot of good things about this book, one of which, one of which were the simple writing. David Sedaris uses very um, easy vocabulary that uh, makes a reading very simple and it flows very well. Also, he uses his own signature David Sedaris humor using sarcasm in all his memoirs. Uh, that alleviates situations that can be serious. Finally, um, he uses a lot of flashbacks and experiences that we've all had, and thus this makes it very relatable to anyone who's read the book. However, there are also certain cons about this book, one of which were the sequence. David Sedaris starts off this book chronologically, from his childhood and going on to adulthood. However, by incorporating so many flashbacks, it confuses the order from chronological to just a mixture of different uh, memoirs and experiences. Also, David Sedaris assumes that the reader has already read his other novels. Thus, he introduces, introduces certain concepts or ideas that the reader doesn't know, but he just puts them out there. One of which were when his father kicked him out of his house, and we suddenly learn that he's homosexual. At times, the logic in this book was strange because decisions he made in the book were weird, especially because he had OCD. However, this was all explained and gave insight into David Sedaris' unique mind. Overall, the Bond's Review gives this book an 8 out of 10. Thank you very much for tuning in. Do not forget to tune in next week as we cover Barack Obama's work, Dreams from My Father. Good night. So David, that's a really that's a really pressing matter. I know what you're talking about. Now, as many of you may know that have read Dress Your Family in Cordery and Denim, there's this one very relatable aspect of the book when he talks about when he <laughs> I see, I see Sam, like, in the corner. <laughs>